VIP access. VIP access with Aniko and Africa Loud. Welcome to VIP Access, the 2023 edition. This is episode seven. I'm very honored to be speaking to a change maker. He's an activist. I'm about to speak to the one and only Emmanuel Jal. Hi. Hi, how are you doing, sister? I'm good. How are you? I'm blessed just like you. Oh, it's so <laughs> awesome to finally be able to sit with you and have a conversation. Um, I just want to kind of set a picture or paint a picture to the people listening or watching. Mm -hmm. You know, um, growing up, I listened to your music, obviously so some of the strides you made as a musician, as an activist, um, and being in the industry, media industry for a long time, it was always um, a dream for me to one day meet you. And you're also somebody who's very busy, always mm -hmm. traveling around the world. You know, you've performed in such big stages, met a lot of big celebrities, you know, at one of the Mandela concerts and seeing you on a picture with Mandela. So you don't really think like you're ever going to meet this person, let alone work with them. And then you get one opportunity to work with them and then another opportunity to meet them. And then you realize that this person is actually a human being. Like <laughs> <laughs> they are down to earth, you know, they're humble. And I think the experience of meeting you has really changed me so much just like to know how down to earth you are despite all the big and massive things you continue to do around the world and all the kind of people you meet but like it's so down to earth yo what's up with that thank you thank you for humbling me with the uh remembering those steps i've taken in my life i've been the way i look at it is each and every one of us has got a purpose and when you walk in your purpose then you'll be making the right steps, the right decision. Sometimes they may not be right as you may think, but there's an understanding I find from a purpose. It gives your life a meaning in every stage of suffering. And if you don't know your purpose, you'll exist to suffer. Whoa. If you don't know your purpose, you will exist to suffer. Yeah. And we don't want to suffer. <laughs> <laughs> but how how do you how did you determine like this is my purpose because you know coming from the background your story you know imagine uh, from being a former child soldier to being an activist to using art and music to create change make change inspire millions how did you discover your purpose and said this is how I want to my brand to be because even the type of music you sing is very happy music is very connecting the masses is very peaceful. Well, I mean, every child knows their purpose, but when you grow older, we, we get diverted, we get influenced, and we, we don't go with the path as we intend to. I would say is your heart, know your potential, and your mind knows your worth. And that's why our heart can push us beyond what we couldn't possibly imagine. Mm. And so as a kid, I always wanted to be a part of a solution. I want to be among the people who are bringing change, who are mm. impacting people positive. And for that, I would imagine it. Sometime I would imagine myself either as a teacher and see how that like in a mm. class teaching kids. Then I say, okay, what about if I became a general in the army? Mm. How that would look like? So I would lie down you know, on any floor and just imagine myself. And these are dreams you had you had as early as when you were a young child. It's really freaking me out because some I used to play imagination game, but I Whoa. did not know that through your imagination, you can create something out of it. Mm. But how I love imagination, because I use it to manage my stress and my managing difficult situations. Okay. So... I discovered as a kid, when I imagine my future in a negative way, mm. it's terrifying. It takes away my mood. I'm not happy and jumping around. I'm mm. sad. And then I would imagine, if I imagine my future in a good way, then I'm motivated. I want to go and play. I want to go and ask questions. I'm curious. And so that's the game I played as a kid. You know, imagine, I used to remember uh, when the food is dropping from the sky, you know, the, when the UN and people will be running for that food. And some of the bags will fall on top of somebody, somebody get hurt. But you're more focused on how much mace I can take for myself. 
Then one day I saw this tin written USA. You know, some of the bags were written USA. And I asked somebody, what is USA? And he told me, it's a country somewhere. And that's what bringing us food. And I said, I want to go to that place. Mm. You know, like the way you say it, and you actually believe it, and then just figure out how to go there. Then I'm in the United States. But apart from imagination, is is for the viewers why. And I would encourage parents or people out there to encourage imagination. How did imagination rescue me as a kid? I would say in one of the toughest journey I've ever been, you know, like where there's this place we arrived in and it was so flooded. And this journey, one of the things that happened to us is we were drinking our own urine for survival. And we ran out of urine. Now some people want to to force their fellow soldiers to drink. I remember we wipe our hand on the grass in the morning and would lick it several times. That's your water. But in this situation, some people lose hope and they just end their lives. And I call this one of the lowest points because it's the lowest point where my friend was dying and I look at him and I tell him, I'm going to eat you tomorrow. In this journey, we were between two to four hundred, and only 16 people managed it in the end. And so I remember we were in this swampy ground, and we walked for the day. If you fall in that water, that swampy ground, people can only see bubbles, bubbles coming out. That's it. Nobody has energy to pick anyone. So there was a bigger soldier with us. A child soldier fell in front of me, he tried to pick the kid, but they all brown. They all drown as I watch them. Here I am, I want to help, but I can't. So you know, you're in a situation where you're helpless to help, your heart is willing, but your body can't. And so I was frozen there. And I discovered when I when your future, your present, and the past collide negatively, at one moment you lose hope. Mm. So hope was crushing me. You know, my hope was going away. And one of the things that rescued me at this moment was, was the, the belief that I'm going to be a part of a solution. And, and just picturing that, that I want to stay alive so I can tell these stories. I want to stay alive. Because what was happening is, is a societal th thought. Because when, you've, when you lose hope and you can't move and you're paralyzed, you don't want to live. There's nothing to live for. Yep. And so the present was challenging, the past is depressing, the future is a it's sea of darkness. Yeah, it's a dim sea of darkness. And, and in this thought, because I was hiding the imagination, when I found something difficult, I tried to imagine something or go in a state of flow where you allow thoughts to pass through your head, then you capture the thought that is exciting. I mean, if I like 70% of the thoughts may be terrible, but maybe yeah. there's one that good thought that come, I try to hold on it and try to magnify it. Yeah. So what happened here, because I like to hide in imagination, my mind asked me a question. Jal, you're always imagining to be a part of a solution in the future. You are now in a problem. What can you do now? I mean, my mind asking me a question, what can you do now? Yeah. So I asked my mind a question back, what is it I can do now? What is it I can possibly do now? People are dying, I'm here. So the question came to my head is, why don't you eat the leaves of that tree? If you don't die, share it with the rest. So I went and ate the leaves of the tree. I didn't die and I shared it. Because you don't know if it's poisonous. I don't know the tree. I don't know. What it is. But there's nothing, completely nothing else to eat. What do you eat? You're in the water and you're hungry where you came from. And the whole day, everybody's starving. The reason people are drowning is not because uh, it's really deep or something. It's because they have no energy to get up. So and at this point, you were, how old were you at this point? I, I think in 1991, turning into, I think I was 11 or 12. And my gun was with me. I had my gun in that water. 
And so what happened is that my head told me, why don't you capture the snails in the water? Eat. And if you don't die. It's the first time that my mind can tell me, ask me a question and try me try. Mm -hmm. And so I gathered the nails. We ate. I ate. People watched. They saw I didn't die. They joined. Mm. The next question, why don't you shoot the vultures that are eating dead bodies? We shot the vulture. Eight. People waited for months because they had believed these vultures don't cook and they kill people. So, I actually th thought I had that in the African culture that vultures are poisonous or yeah. that if you eat a vulture, you will definitely die because they eat carcasses. I know, I didn't die. You ate <laughs> I, vultures? I ate vultures. There's no piece that was thrown away. I think my digestive system, that <laughs> must have been be so and, strong. And you ate raw vultures? No, no, we cooked it. I okay. think if it was raw, it probably killed us. We roasted it. it was like the way you... Was it nice It's like tasting? chicken. It's almost like chicken, okay. like family. Okay, so that was... But tough of meat. Okay. And so when we survived this, you know... I came to discover that our perspective, our beliefs can blind us from opportunities. We were dying not because there was no food. We're dying because in our beliefs and our perspective that we cannot eat frogs, we cannot eat snails, we cannot eat this. There was plenty of food, you know? Even this, there's a, alligator's cousins were moving around us. You know, we should have eaten them. I mean... And by, through imagination and allowing your mind to flow and asking the right question, led me into finding a new way. And that's the same formula. Whenever I'm anywhere, I ask myself, what is the best thing I can do now? What is it I can do now? Mm. During COVID time, most artists, we're locked down. And I can say I made more money during COVID time more than other times when we're so free. Whoa. And the simple question was like, was like, now you're in lockdown, what do you do? People are going crazy. You try to do podcasts. There are people who podcast themselves before you, but you're trying to do, where can I do now? <clears throat> How do I survive? Mm. And so a simple question, imagining something believing in it, then going out and make it, making it work. Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. That is the <clears throat> most detailed answer I've ever been given for one question. Like oh, how... sorry about that. No, 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 no. I, I can loved talk for it. long. Yeah. I really, really loved it because you didn't answer it like on, like in a, on, in a light way, but mm. you wanted to go way back from the moment you knew your purpose when you were younger and how you st stuck to it. So I, I like that answer. Jal, you are from South Sudan originally, and you also have lived in Kenya. I mean, we're in Kenya right now, which is also part of your home. Um, do you remember the journey from South Sudan to Kenya and how long did you live here to feel like this was my home? Hmm. And when? I was smuggled to Kenya in this journey. I was explaining to you where I arrived in a place called Word. And I met a British aid worker called Emma McCune. And she's the one who smuggled me. My intention when I first set off was not to come to Kenya. I wanted to go to my village, want to find out where my sisters are. Yeah, that's where I wanted to go. Mm. Thank you. But... You know, the universe has its own plans. It has its own way of bringing us into the path. It has, it has a way of taking care of its own. That's what I can say. There's nowhere on earth that I've been that I haven't found a big problem that want to swallow me or eat me alive. Mm -hmm. I haven't, you know. You see, in the, in the concrete jungle, it's different than the real jungle. In the real jungle, you know, this is a hyena. You know, that tree, there's a banana. You know, this is an elephant. But in a concrete jungle, you cannot know where's the tigers coming from. Yeah. Which one is a hippo. You don't know which one is the python. <laughs> you just move around. <laughs> I don't know if I'm making sense in terms of... You pop. are, you are. Yeah. yeah. And then, 
so so you were smuggled into Kenya. Yeah. And then were you at the refugee camp or where were you living when you smuggled in? I was uh, I was actually just got rescued. I just survived the journey. But I went, I was just, my gun was removed from me. Emma told me I'm going to take you to school. So I had two guns, one for my friend that died and one for mine. So my gun was taken away from me. And then I was brought in. A, the way I was brought into Kenya was like a movie because there was no papers. And so she took me into the plane. How we crawl into the plane. Basically, she was talking to the pilots making them busy and the security people were all looking at those days there were no cameras so I crawled around the bags got myself into the into the plane whoa whoa <laughs> whoa I was also when I arrived here now Loki Chokyo was the same act she come because Emma is like a model she talks she make a big walk big talk by the time everybody's focusing and I'm out of the plane <laughs> same thing we took on another plane and I was brought to Wilson Airport. And what's her full name? Emma? McCune. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. She rescued you. I even have a song called Emma, which is uh, the one I perform at Nelson Mandela, yeah. 90th part. But uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you're here. You find yourself in Kenya. You have dreams of going to America. You have dreams of going around the world. You have your music starting to do magic for you. Um, at what point did you feel like, now I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Now I'm actually living the dreams I've had in my mind. You know, how did you end up, you know, meeting Nelson Mandela and finding yourself at these spaces um, with other global leaders, with other change makers? You know, I think one of the things I came to realize that's allowed me to relax now. You know, the older you get, the more you find flow walking in your purpose, mm. the better, you know. So I want to explain this is your thoughts, you know, or what you're thinking, create your density in which you can be, that become your frequency to which others can connect with you. And so the way I look at it is, you can take stones, coins, sugar, and sand, all kind of objects, put them in a ball, and you just move the balls. And they'll organize themselves into sizes. And that's how I look at it in terms of thought qualities. The way you hold your thoughts in your mind, how, how, how the density of your heart and the density of your mind will pull you to a direction. So I found myself being pulled to certain field. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, there's similar way I could explain it. There's one story that always, that shocked me. You know, have you ever been in a situation, you're in a room with people and there's an energy from somebody that you don't like? Many times. And then there's somebody <laughs> that does men may not look attractive, but you're attracted to their energy levels. Mm -hmm. Or somebody may be able to read your thoughts and provide for you what it is that you're asking for mm. without them communicating. I remember we we were like around two or three hundred kids in a place called Shambag. And in this place, um, we were kids. We were seven years old. People were starving. And so we were lying in a building, like a long building. And this one woman turned up. So you know, in the in the day at night, like around five, we get locked into a big store. Like this, this building to now fungi and done. They mm. lock us, you know. Whoa. Because there's a there's an animal that eat people, eat children. So we cannot move around. They don't risk that. Mm. So in the morning or in the evenings, so this woman turned up and there was this long line. And she spoke with the guards that were with us and she told them. I only have food for one child, food for one child. And in my heart, I said, that child you're going to feed would be me. Then I also have a conversation. I said, look, but if there's any kid here who can tell our story best when we survive this journey, let that kid eat that food. So I have a conversation I want to eat, but I also pass a word if there's any kid 
who can survive this journey and tell our story and our suffering. I want that kid to have that food. And I just kept quiet. So the woman come and passed by me, went all the way to the line, then came back and said, I want that child. She picked me, took me to her place, fed me every day. And when she was feeding me food, she was telling me, oh, you know what, I've been praying that I pick a child that will stay alive, that will eat this food, and that will tell our story. That has been my prayer. I don't have much. And you understand? to me, I'm just a shut up. Let me just eat this food. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, somebody's bothering me. I'm hungry. And I put some <laughs> into the pocket. She's feeding me and I put some in the pocket because I want to go and share with the other kids. Mm. And when I remember that is... Now, what science has proven that we can communicate with our hearts and our mind. So she told me when I came next to you, I felt something different. I was with all other kids. But, but that's, knew- that's the thing. Like the first time I met you, I felt a strong energy. I've never told anyone this. I only told my husband yeah. because I was so excited. Like the, you, you had one of your retreats. Yeah. You had all your guests from all over um, the world come to Kenya. And when I got the invite, I was like, oh my God, me, me, I'm going to meet my, my, my little Jal. So I came <laughs> there just waiting. Um, and then when you walked in, I remember you were wearing like a clock, like a black <laughs> clock and nothing else, just like a nice black clock clock you know like when the people wear white kanzus and you had the black thing and you just entered the room and there was a strong energy (laughs) big energy and now i don't feel it and i don't know maybe because we already met yeah but there was a big energy when you walked in like powerful thing moving and i don't know if you've been told this by other people but i felt it the first day we met I mean, we all feel energy, you know, about the energy thing. But did some people tell you, like, they felt some sort of energy from you? The weirdest thing that shocked me was I was in Toronto one time. And uh, I think it depends on, on, on what state you are as a person. Yeah. You may like, Have you ever met those people who have gone and fasted for days and then come and hang out around you and their energy level? And maybe they start talking to you about God's their words is different. <laughs> So there's this, I was in a, this train in Toronto and the way I dressed was so bad, like that day I was in rest. <laughs> but the joy and the peace of mind I had in was something, was tremendous. Was something else. So when I was stepping out, this lady come to me and, and said, you want to talk to me? And she was so beautiful, like. And I said, wow, I was on a wife hunt during that time. I said, God, <laughs> thank you for bringing my wife to me. <laughs> can you imagine? And then the next thing is telling, can I talk to you? And I say, yes, I would like to, to have a conversation with you. Yes, I saw the way you look. Yes, the way you look did not want me to, to communicate with you. But when I saw your eyes and saw, saw your face and read your energy, I just trusted that I can talk to you. And I said, wow. And then the lady, we went somewhere and sat down. And what she told me, she told me, she told me I'm a high-end prostitute. And I said, what do you mean that? To me, and I'm like, you want to ask me money now in my head and start talking like high-end prostitute? What do you mean? I'm just a hustler from Africa. I can't afford. <laughs> but I listened. And she said, look, she, I get paid $1,000 to $2,000 an hour. So her clients are celebrities. You know, like big celebrities, Ooh. people of money, millionaires. So she'll be hired to go and hang out with them. And she said, I am married. I have a husband. But my husband does not know what I do. She just knows me that I'm doing this daytime job here. But she doesn't know my other job. Mm. And so, and I just wanted to find someone that I can trust and tell this darkness because it's eating me. Oh. And I'm finally... She hasn't been able to share that with, with anybody. Anyone, anybody. And she told me, look, today is the day I made my mind. I will not do it. And she told me she made enough money. She bought a house back in, in South America. And now she's going to take her family back. And she told me a story. The reason she went there, her husband used to work in a bank and got paralyzed. And because he got paralyzed, so she had to see how she can take care of her family mm. and kids. But right now, she told me that. She told me her story. She was crying. And I told her my story. And it's like, uh, we told each other a story just to build that trust. And then I told her, give me your contacts. And she told me, 
I can give you my contact because now my story lives in you and your story lives in me. So we're connected. Whoa. And I said, like, how does somebody just come? And it reminded me of how it is, like, you know, the power of finding someone you can trust and confessing. By the time she was leaving, she said, I feel so light that I found someone that I can tell what I've been doing for a very long Whoa. time that has been eating her. So she made so much money. She bought houses. She started a business. She's just taking her husband and they're going to, she's going to change her life completely. And I'm, how is it that you're on a train and you come out and somebody could trust you like that? So I feel like that's why I like to be, I like to keep my joy and peace of mind because it gives, it generates lux for me. Yeah. Yeah. I want to segue from that to yeah. the other thing that yeah. I'm not sure if people know that you also do and you have the power to do. Mm. So you do cure trauma. trauma. Yeah. And how do you cure trauma? And when did you start curing trauma? What's that mm -hmm. process like? So basically, my, the question I normally ask people is, who owns your mind? Yeah. Is it fear, worry, and anxiety or poverty who owns your mind because the battles are fought in the mind and they're won in the heart. Well, what on my mind in the past was fear, was worry, was anxiety, was poverty. But what dominated my mind the most was trauma. And so, and, and, and what is it? To me, I would define trauma as a soul murder. I'll define it as a mental genocide. I would define it as an invasion of demons to occupy space in your mind so you have flashbacks in the day and nightmares at night. And so some people don't even know they have trauma and they will not try to go and seek it. Some know, but then seek for help. Some, those who know, will go for it. Mm -hmm. And what are the signs of trauma? If you find anyone who does not give, forgive easily and hold things into heart, behind that is trauma. And if you find someone with excessive anxieties, beyond the norm, that's trauma. And one of the greatest signs you could find, if somebody's depressed in bed, that's trauma. Because the trauma, you know, when you can no longer see the future, you know, I always say is high stress, trauma, and poverty shut down the faculties of our mind that are responsible for long-term projects. And me coming for that, how did trauma impact me? I remember when I was in school here in Kenya, a teacher would teach in a class and I would have a flashback of something happened in the past. And then now the pen will be stuck in my hand and I'd wish the teacher asked me a question. Jal, what is in your head? And nobody did, nobody. And that's not only me, there are a lot of people probably right now in class, in school, and I can give you the signs of traumatic kids in school their mind has no other capacity to take in information. So they're more interested in the arts. They will enjoy the drawing. They will enjoy the PE. They'll enjoy the football. They'll enjoy stories. When it comes to history in class and the teachers tell history, I'm like this, you know? When we're being taught in English and they drink all this common ground and whatever, how do you, how do you call those? Uh, there's a name they, when you're making sentence, mm. com is it compound? Or I forgot, but those names, you know, when you're teaching English, there's certain names they give, verb, proverb, you know, you know, proverb and verb and nouns and all. Mm. I, they used, I never liked them. But when it comes to stories that they're telling, then how my mind will be drawn. So traumatic people, their brain are pulled easily by stories. Their imagination is massive. But their conscious mind, the part that deal with reason and difficult stuff, is the one that is attacked by the former. Mm -hmm. So they'll act like children, you know. How did it impact me? When I was in school, I remember I repeated one class three times, four times. Like, I was a super doof, you know. But the teachers would say, this guy's brain is like this. But they don't know that there's something else that occupies space in your mind. Mm. Yeah. And so overcoming it, there's a, it was a whole process. And I'll describe it simply. The first step that I did was to liberate my heart, and liberating my heart from bitterness. And that's the first time I was able to experience heaven because I, 
I was able to let go a lot of things that I've been building in my heart, you know? You know, you see the memories, your home burned down, uh, witnessed my aunt ripped in front of me as a kid. Uh, people was hurt me along the way in the process, losing your home, being seeing my mom abused in front of me as a kid and slapped and I was beaten too and blacked out. So many things that were held in me by letting them go, I was just able to experience freedom. Mm -hmm. And then the next step was, was how to unite my heart and mind because any, any kingdom that is not united shall be destroyed. And as a human being, you're a holistic person. Your heart is like the king yeah. or the queen and your mind, your conscious mind is like the prime minister. Your subconscious is like the government. Each and every, your cells in your body is like the land or the, or the memory. Your memory is like the land to which everything is built and your intuitions and your imagination is the creative faculty to which everything is created. Then you go to your intuition, which is your intelligence, your judiciary, the governance, the things that allow you, you to discern situation to make the right decision. So I look at it. The step I did is how uniting my heart and my mind. So when I was able to unite my heart and my mind, the next step was now facing my trauma. And after I liberated my trauma, I was able to become normal again. And I describe it in three ways to which, well, it, somebody can practice when they go home. Is, there are three pills a person has to swallow. Mm. But before those three pills is, I would say for you, in order for you to overcome your trauma or to rewire your brain, you have to um, reprogram your mind. And though you, how you do it is, you have to know your purpose. Then know your vision and change your environment. So when, because your purpose is for your heart, your vision is for your mind. Your, your vision is what it is you want to create. What is that gracious, that audacious idea you want to bring into this world? What is it that thing you're imagining, you know? So how, if you see it in your head, then now your purpose is how you live your life because your purpose will give your life a meaning in every stage of suffering. And when you don't find a meaning in your suffering, you exist to suffer. That's why you find someone complaining in a loop every day, the same thing. Have you ever met friends that they talk about the same thing, the same person over and over? But once they find a meaning in that stage of suffering, they move on to the next step. And so, and how would you, what is your purpose? Anything that you do without expecting anything in return. Anything that gives you joy. So, and you measure yourself. If your joy is being drained out of you every day, you're not walking in your purpose. Yeah. So when you make a decision and you find that it's sucking away your joy and it's drying you from inside, you're not in your purpose. And so, and so once you know your vision, you know your purpose, you change your environment. There are two types of environment. There's internal environment and external environment. External environment means who you hang out, what you hear, what you see, what you smell, everything around that you can aware of. So that means you have to cut some friends. Now, if you have people who whine all the time, you can you can you can carry their emotions. You no, know, I will give you an example. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a South Sudanese by DNA, but emotionally, spiritually, I am not South Sudanese. Even my mind is not South Sudanese. I've grew up in Kenya. I've eaten Ugali, Sukumawiki. I've interacted with different schools. So I've been impacted by that environment. Yep. I've gone to United States. So because we say what? Who you hang out around with. Those top five people you hang out around with has a tremendous impact on how you live your life every day. So once you change your external environment, the internal environment is focused on only two things, habits and beliefs. And so... And as I finish my point is, science says 95% of decisions we make every day are done by subconscious mm. and 5% are done by a conscious mind. And so if the summation of emotion we generate every day make our decisions and the summation of decisions we make every day create our future, mm. then what kind of life are we living? So basically, if you're born poor, you're likely going to be poor for the rest of your life. Unless you know your vision, you know your purpose, and change your environment. 
And if you're born wealthy, you're likely going to be wealthy for the rest of your life unless you don't know your purpose, you don't know your vision, and you change your environment. And so once you know your purpose, your vision, and you change your environment, there are three pills you have to swallow. The first pill would be a mantra. So for example, when someone is traumatized, it's like the programs, the softwares that can make them function to their full potential are shut down. Mm. So they have to reactivate them or install new software. So if they're full of love before, now hate has been put in. If they were not worth before, you know your worth, but now your worth is taken. You'll find some who don't feel enough. They don't find themselves worthy. They think they're stupid. So now, identifying what's the software you want to bring in your mind. Mm. So for me, what I realized, what my trauma did is took away my focus. Mm. And focus, if you can't focus, you can't create anything. And so I was able to program myself. I'm focused 200 times a day. You repeat that word. I'm focused. Thank you, God, for making me focus. Or thank you, Jesus, or whatever you feel, mm. 200 times a day. What would that do? There's a part in our mind which is, which is which are in, in, in our brain called reptilian brain. It's in our mind called reptilian brain, which holds our building motivation. Mm. And that's what holds our belief. So you hack into it to create a belief. The second step you go for is you go and research about focus. So you bring in knowledge. So the subconscious mind learned through repetition, but the conscious mind learned through curiosity. After you repeat the mantra, you go and be curious and gather the knowledge. Then the third step that you do, which I call the first step is red pill. Second step is blue pill. The third step, which is incremental step of action. So you do those incremental step of action every day. It's like you have known now, you've done your mantra, that you focus. And the second step is you gather knowledge about focus and then you practice how to be focused. You do that every day for 30 days. What will happen to our brain is your brain will release what is called neurotrophins. And those trophin, neurotrophins will create new dendrites in your brain that will absorb information for short term and long term. And then what we're actually looking for to transform our life is something called myelin. So once you create myelin in your brain, then you have transformed your life. So it doesn't mean my trauma is gone, but what has happened is I've created new pathways to which I can be able to manage my life. So I've denied the old pathways, nutrients. So the, oh, when you find somebody repeating, and it, the dendrites or the myelins, the myelins take 30 to 50 years to disintegrate. So it's not easy for someone to change their habits over there. Mm. That's why we have to practice. You find someone with chips and sausage every day. And then the doctor tells them you're going to die in the next one year. They know they're going to die. Two days, they'll forget eating chips and sausage. And all of a sudden, their body just wants chips and sausage. So they have to create the habit and the belief. So you have to have a routine, a system in place to change yourself incrementally. Mm -hmm. Talking of chips and sausages, we are eating more healthy food in 2023. And you have launched your new cafe in Nairobi at the Kenyatta market called Jalgua. Yeah. All of you need to come to Jalgua. And it's so beautiful. I got the honor to be there and to eat. And they're serving food in nice calabashes. Have you drunk soup with a calabash? <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice. Yeah. So... You already launched the cafe. It's open and running. How do you feel about that? And what was the inspiration behind opening Jalgua, which actually is a brand that you already had before? Well, Jalgua is the brand. It's created because, I know, in my career, I had high blood pressure. I used to eat so bad. I used to drink a lot of Coca-Cola, maybe three liters a day. And at one point, I would test my skin and test and smell like Coke. Really? Yeah taste and smell like coke but nobody would know that i drink a lot of coke because you hide it you just have one but you get yeah. yourself the. i you had know. my fair share of those coca-cola <laughs> days so a friend of mine told me no judgment <laughs> <laughs> you know i, I met this guy in toronto and he told me i used to cheat my wife with what he said i used to cut a lot of chocolate <laughs> and they didn't go and eat them in a cupboard somewhere and then come back but so i'm just saying 
when I was touring, so I would collapse. In Nairobi, I was admitted at Masaba Hospital for high blood pressure, Nairobi yeah. Hospital, life. But the worst that got me straight was in New York, you know. In fact, I think it was at a Soho house. I was sleeping in there because they have those special rooms. Then Tani had the key because I told her I'm not feeling well. When she came, I was like this. If she didn't put cold water into my body in a towel, then that was it. I would have gotten a stroke. Jeez. I would have been paralyzed. And since then I said, what do I do? Then I remember high blood pressure and all the symptoms of diabetes and also pains in your joints was associated to people in the cities, the people eat in the cities. Mm. And then I said, okay, I want to eat like in the village. Mm. And that's when I introduced sorghum into my life. Mm. So I remember looking for sorghum in Toronto. Must have been so hard, oh, eh? Seriously. And when I found sorghum, I was so happy. My body was just absorbing it. My energy level increased. Then I was into food. So I studied food for at least four, five years, just foodie. Mm. And I managed to cure my high blood pressure using food, potassium, magnesium def deficiency, vitamin D, K, and E. And so the foods that I was eating did not have that. Mm. What doctors were telling me is genetic. Oh, your father has or whatever. But I said, no. So, but when I learn about this doctor's foods, doctors, and you go and learn, there was a doctor called Joe Wallach, Dr. Sebi, and many other contents that I used to read. There was another big book about nutrition like this, you know, that tells you what food to eat. And finally, that made me into a foodie. So Jalgwa itself was formed. It's a name. I gave it, I call it Jalgwa because of the food, two food, sorghum and Moringa, I put them together. And that's what formed Jalgwa. Ah. So, and when I'm on road, I, I was not getting the energy. So I yeah. developed a powder form that I can put in water mm. and drink, put in a yogurt, mm. put in different things. And that's how Jal goes form. Mm. And so now knowing this knowledge and coming back to Africa and say, look, we have superfoods here, but we're ignoring this. Most disease we have can be cured by food. Mm. Yeah. Whoa. So we had somebody, I met a guy today and he's talking to everybody. He, said, I, he told me he had ulcers for 30 years getting medication. Damn. And he said in three days, he just destroyed his ulcers. Yeah. And I, he asked me what did, because when I was telling him he was laughing to prescribe for him cooking, ugali a brown, make sure it's organic. Now kunyo na maziomala or fresh milk if you have ulcers. And then wood in the morning, made out of sorghum fermented, put your moringa. Then come in the evening, have what of our, Ugali are brown with something. And just in two days, he said he shut his head down. Because what's happening, he could not believe it. And so that simple things, like we have this simple knowledge, the foods we have are healing. When have when we ever seen a watchman or a boy sick? It's always the boss. We look at the food that they eat when it comes into my head. <laughs> Why are they eating sukuma wiki? But you're spitting truth. I yeah. will just say the truth. That yeah. is the truth. Bo boss <laughs> is the one in the hospital. He can't sleep. Boss is the one in the hospital. You know, those home scientists, the, the home scientists never get sick. No. And then the soldier, the, you know what? I was talking to this soldier. He told me, you know when I was a soldier? He said, yeah, you come, Gonjo. He can know of Uber. He told me he bought himself this car. He saved his money and took some loan and bought himself. <laughs> this, you know, the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the Uber Kikwiti yes. sold just like. And say, now one year, Nina Kitambi, Nakula chips, Nakuti sold, I'm buying other stuff. But I'm sick like my boss. <laughs> okay, so in summary, yeah. um, we are advocating for healthy living, healthy eating, yeah. um, more natural made products. Yeah. Um, and in Aje, this Ugali, we call it Kwon Bell. Kwon Bell. We call it Kwon Bell in my mother tongue. The same? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because we are cousins. Yes. Same. Yeah. We didn't even talk about your music, and now we are finishing. I mean, so, there's a new album, Shanga, is out now. Yeah. 
Um, and how's your sister? Jeez, I miss Nyaruach. Nyaruach? Nyaruach is there. Oh, yeah, Nyaruach is she's cool. She's in UK now. But she'll come back. Okay. You know, with the music, you can always mix it in, in yes, the song. Yes, yes, Just say, yes. this is a man of Jal song. But I would say, come and visit Jal Gwad Kenyatta Market. We have all good stuff, shea butter, honey. We pack our own nuts. We make our own peanut butter. We do our best to make things throw. Just come and have a and taste. And all of them are made in Kenya? Yes. Okay, fantastic. And also, we even have shoes. <laughs> so basically now, when you go to Kenyatta, we partner with different people. So now we have these ideas. You buy a shoe written in your name, then you give one shoe away to kids who can afford it. And that's when it's like, so far we've, we started it like seven days ago and we shifted 50 shoes right now. To where? Some to South Sudan and we're going to take some to Kakuma. So you buy a now shoe in Kibir. And- now in Kibera, so they brought this, this, there's um, some of the last person who bought, so the, the, the shoemaker said, look, they found this uh, mother who has this child that goes to school, but Anna Viato. And so now somebody bought a shoe and their name is going to be put on it. Mm. And now that shoe's going to go there. Nice. So like the, you saw the fundis, they're yes. so happy that like you're making shoe but you're making an impact at the same time. I love it. I love it. Always making an impact. That's you. That's Jal for you. Um, and that's why we're wrapping off. Like, we didn't even talk about the music because there's so many stories. <laughs> next there's time. so many inspirations. And all time. these stories and inspirations do make the music or inspire the albums. So go out there and listen to the latest album by Emmanuel Jal, which is called Shanga. Um, and there are so many other dope albums out there. There's Nat with Nyaruach, dope record. I really loved it. There's a lot of remixes from the Shanga album already, uh, which are out there. You can go and distribute. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm just so thankful to be in your presence, to hear your story and to just be in your presence. Like, I don't even know what to say. Like, I'm just thankful. It's the same, my sister. You've been a blessing to us. I mean, three, four years now. Yeah. Every time we're doing something, you always push us out there. And I'm grateful that you came for the launch. Asante. Asante sana. Thank you, everyone who's listening or watching us from wherever in the world. Um, It's been such an inspiring episode. I hope you are also touched as much as I was. I'm very thankful to this legendary artist and person, um, Emmanuel Jal. Keep it here on VIP Access. I will be back next week with yet another powerful story. VIP Access. VIP Access. With Aniko on Africa Loud.